for those that are unaware, um, today's event is being hosted by the Triad Food and Beverage Coalition. We are an educational and advocacy program that is advocating, obviously, on behalf of the, the large number of restaurants and bars that we have throughout the uh, 13 county Piedmont Triad region. Um, we are obviously sort of focused on locally, independently owned restaurants, but we also have people that, you know, obviously restaurants that we're advocating on behalf of that do fall in that franchise category as well. Um, and so I've, we, we pulled this group together back in March of um, this year as a response to the, the COVID-19 um, shutdowns, um, similar to how the Independent Restaurant Coalition came together and just saw a big need for, um, for a group to come together that could advocate on behalf of the restaurant and bar community here in our region. So I've, I've enjoyed pulling this together. Um, the, the pod father, also known as Tim Beeman, who's in the room with us today, he can remember when I first started talking about all this maybe a couple of years ago. So th this is, um, this has actually been a lot of fun for me this, this summer. Obviously, the, the, the thing that has not been fun is that we've got so many restaurants and bars that are in pain and hurting right now and trying to navigate through this unprecedented time. And so over the summer, I've been able to connect with Chef Katie Button, who's on the leadership committee for the Independent Restaurant Coalition. I know many of you have heard of the IRC. You've probably seen something online about them, maybe even seen something on television. They've been very active and getting a lot of attention at a national level. They have authored a bill called the Restaurant Act, which would provide $120 billion to um, predominantly independently owned restaurants and bars throughout the country. Um, they have successfully even gotten that bill through the House. And um, it, right now it's stalled on the Senate side for, for many reasons that all of us are aware of. So I, I've been wanting to get um, someone from the IRC lined up to do a conversation with you all. And so I'm very thankful that Erica Polmar, um, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the IRC, has agreed to join us. Erica is not only the Chief Operating Officer, but she's also a founding member and um, helps, obviously, and she's been advocating for culinary and agricultural businesses while working to eradicate food insecurity in Oregon for the better part of two, two, two decades. Erica, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for, for agreeing to do this. I think um, everyone in the room and even those that see the recast will get a lot of value out of our, our conversation today. I want to be mindful of time. I know everyone that's in the room is busy. Eric, I know you're super busy. You can be hard to catch up with. So um, I do want to um, be very mindful of your time. You know, Erica, just to kick off the discussion, um, how about just giving um, everyone in the room just sort of an overview of what the Independent Restaurant Coalition is all about. And, you know, for a lot of us, we are already aware of the National Restaurant Association. And maybe you could also include why you felt like there was a need for a separate trade group outside of NRA. That's a great question. Um, the Independent Restaurant Coalition was formed on March 18th when a number of chefs and restaurateurs had just a simple conference call to share ideas about what the heck we were all going to do next as we were watching restaurants close around the country. And through that conversation, as many small communities have had similar conversations, it was just this sense that there wasn't anybody truly speaking for the independent restaurant community at a policy level in state or in federal government. And so the Independent Restaurant Coalition formed with the singular mission of trying to find financial support for the restaurants and bars affected by the COVID-19 crisis and the substantial significant economic fallout. We represent about 500,000 small businesses across the country, employing more than 11 million Americans and playing a key role in the $760 billion restaurant economy, which I'm assuming most of the folks on this call are either a part of or adjacent to in some way. Um, independent restaurants are certainly in many cities and states uh, participants in the National Restaurant Association state chapters as well. But there, there are distinct needs that this community had. And so we started advocating for them. 
um, with the support of Congressman Blumenauer and Congressman Fitzpatrick. The Restaurants Act was created in the House and with the support of Senator Wicker and Senator Sinema, the co companion bill was formed in the Senate. Both provide $120 billion in relief in the form of a restaurant revitalization fund. And just to give you some big picture numbers and we can get into the weeds of this all if you all would like, uh, that $120 billion investment in restaurants would generate up to $271 billion in secondary and primary economic benefits. So it's a great investment. Um, as I'm sure you all are aware, restaurants really can't afford to take on more loans. Debt service is just something that won't work. So as much as the PPP loan program was a great short-term solution for many people, it it was like building a bridge halfway over a really big river and it just didn't quite do what we need to do in order to see all of these great community partners that we have in restaurants survive this crisis. I'm afraid you're on all right, mute. Sorry there, I, there I, know, know, I had to mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just, just to bring it home for some of the folks that are on the call today, um, right here in North Carolina, uh, food services account for 8.7% of all employment in North Carolina and 16% of the state's tax revenue in 2019. Uh, also, an estimated 76% of eateries in North Carolina happen to be independently owned, and uh, nearly 65% of the revenue local independent restaurants here in North Carolina recirculates in the local economy. I always like to remind folks that when your, your kid needs an ad in the school yearbook or you need a sponsor for the local Little League team or you, you want to hold a spirit night for your, your cheerleading squad, a lot of times it's restaurants, locally owned, independently owned restaurants that are, are um, making those contributions and those investments. So it is certainly a community that, that needs our support um, and, and needs a lot of attention right now, considering the, the environment we're trying to navigate towards or through. Um, you, you, talk, you hit on the Restaurant Act a little bit, Erica, but I, I, I want to I get a little bit deeper into it. Um, you, you know, I, I tend to be someone that's fiscally conservative. I like to always add that fiscal word in, in front. And I'm sure there's a little bit of pain and, and consternation from my friends in Washington when you've tried to approach them for industry-specific aid. Uh, what, what, what makes restaurants so different that they, they need to have a separate pot of money to pull from than, than every other small business you know, industry in our country? Well, you just said it a moment ago. Restaurants are really the cornerstone of your communities. They are the places you go when you do need something for the kids team, they're the places you go to celebrate, and that 65% of funding that comes in the door, so for every dollar spent in your independent restaurant, 65% of it at a bare minimum is going right back out the door. And you think about that in terms of supply chain, those dollars are going to your local farmers who are providing product or ranchers or fishermen. Um, they are going to the florist, the linen supplier. So there's this really tight circle of how that money works. And, and the other thing you want to think about with independent restaurants is just how many people get their first foot into the door for their working life in a restaurant. How many single moms are employed by the independent restaurants? Um, we are the number one employer I believe of single moms and folks that are returning to work after things like incarceration so we're a great first step in employment and we just employ so many darn people you know we don't like to compare ourselves to other industries but you know we um, like you said, in, in North Carolina, it's 8.7% of all of your employment. Here where I am in Oregon, we are the largest employer second only to healthcare. So we are a big part of those communities. Um, the restaurants also, as I'm sure you all are aware, are a key piece of tourism. So when folks come to town, you know, what's the first thing they're looking for? Besides getting out, you know, on a road trip, getting out of the car to run into a restroom, it's a place to grab a good bite to eat. 
and they want to experience your history and culture through the food in your communities. So um, I noticed that in North Carolina, that 75% number you shared of independent restaurants, that amounts to 19,500 restaurants and bars. That's an incredible number. And I don't know your other largest industries, but maybe you can tell me who else employs that many people in your community? You, you know, that's a good question. One I, I wasn't quite prepared for, Erica, but I, I, I will tell you <laughs> that I, I, I noticed that um, Greg Thompson, who, who's our state director for the um, National Federation of Independent Businesses, happens to be with us on this on this call. So I may pull him in and let him chime in there. I will add real quickly before Greg speaks that um, my first job um, at, at 15 was at McDonald's where I learned how to make biscuits and I learned how to you know, run a little bit, a bit of a business. By the time I was 16 years old, I was a service manager and I would say that that really set the course for me and, and sort of a lot of things that I went on to do in my career. And my daughter at age 15, um, I'm proud to say that her first job was at my restaurant at Zesto. And um, she did a heck of a job. I didn't fire her by the end of the summer. So she, she, she did a really great job for us. But all jokes aside, it, it really sets the tone and the stage for a lot of our young workers when they're able to go to work that, 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 at that age. And most often, as Erica has stated, that's probably going to be at a restaurant. Greg, do you happen to have any insight on the question that Erica just, just answered? I, I know you all keep your finger on the pulse when it comes to um, small business here. And Greg, before you start, I see somebody posted something about agriculture being number one in North Carolina. And um, the Restaurants Act would provide $481 million in benefits to folks like fishermen, butchers, and your 40,000 small farmers. So that number is significant. Greg, tell me about small business. <laughs> Greg, are you on mute there? Because we're, we're not getting any sound out of you. I, I don't see you muted. But... Technology can't live with it, can't live without it. I, I know we're all going to be like expert Zoomers um, by 2021 here. Greg, if you want to play with it, I, I'd love to sort of circle back and bring you into the conversation. It looks like maybe you froze up on me a little bit there. Yeah, he may be having some technology issues. We'll give him a moment to, to work that through, but I'd love for Greg to chime in on the conversation. I know he's got a lot of, a lot of great insight for us. Um, and, and then I did. Yeah, there you go. Yay, there you go. I had to unplug something, uh, unplug a monitor. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Erica, thank you for that, what you do and, and the information that you provided and Algernon for, for the invitation to join you. You know, uh, what, Erica, what you were saying is around the, the restaurant industry, independent restaurant industry, um, uh, it, it, we all know it goes into so many other areas, as you mentioned, agriculture, but, you know, tourism is probably uh, one of our largest uh, employers, largest industries. Uh, and uh, that, of course, would include uh, tremendous numbers uh, and, and impact from the independent restaurants. Uh, as you know, NFIB only, rep we don't, you can only be a member of NFIB if you're an independent business owner. So we represent uh, the independent business owners and, and restaurants. And Algernon, and, and my, my first job or was to waiting tables in a restaurant. And uh, what I enjoyed it, thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and, uh, uh, and my son is doing the same uh, at freshman in college. But uh, the impact from the independent restaurants in, in our state and the counties, you're exactly right. I mean, uh, it's uh, what they do in, within the communities. I came from a very small town in Western North Carolina and uh, it is the small businesses, the small uh, restaurant uh, owners that uh, are the ones who 
uh, uh, are involved with the, as you said, the yearbook annual, the, 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 you know, newspaper ads, the graduations and everything. And, and we have got to do something. Uh, we've all got to work together to do something to help. As I sit here in, in, on Fable Street in downtown Raleigh, seeing how many of these small restaurants have already closed. Um, I mean, I, I, I've heard, you know, numbers of upwards of, of 30% that, that won't reopen, won't be able to reopen. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it's devastating. Um, and you're right, the, the, you know, PPP run out, the EIDLs run out. I mean, we've got to do something to working with Congress and with the legislature to help these restaurant owners because it's, you know, people think that small independent restaurant owners or, or business owners in general have, uh, have reserves or have, uh, you know, money uh, saved up or whatever. They don't, they work, as you know, and you can tell me a lot more than I can say, but from day to day, uh, what, you know, what they're to, to, to just, just to make ends meet. So, um, you know, I'm, Ha you know, happy to work with, uh, with, with you all in any way that we can uh, to, to help try to uh, get more attention to or more money or whatever with, uh, with the independent restaurants. No, Greg, thank you for, for sharing those comments. And as always, like I said, I'm going to take you up on that offer. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, put you on blast here. I've actually been trying to follow up with you. Um, but hadn't been able to get in touch with you. So I, I may either need to get an updated number or an updated email, but I, I definitely want to, uh, uh, Gordon Hunt and I have been talking and we, we certainly want to find more ways that our coalition can work alongside of, of what, what you all do on a day-to-day -day basis and not just here in North Carolina, but but also at the, the, the national level as well. You, you know, Erica, there, there have been several people making comments about PPP, um, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I know a lot of times when trying to get an appropriation from whether it be from Raleigh here in, in North Carolina or even from Washington, D.C., a lot of times they prefer to work through programs that are already existing uh, versus create something brand new like the, um, the Restaurant Act would do. Do you, do you think, do you see a pathway where the Restaurant Act and the funds that would be appropriated for restaurants could actually just be uh, mobilized through PPP or are you, you pretty, or you feel like, um, you feel strongly that there needs to be a completely separate new program? We feel very strongly that there needs to be a separate new program. I mean, if they want to do both, that's just fine. We wouldn't complain about that. Uh, I don't know if anyone on this call received a PPP loan. Yes, no, yes. Okay, was it was it easy to implement? Was it easy to get your employment numbers where they needed to be in order for you to get forgiveness? That when you look at the way restaurants are functioning now, they're not operating at their full capacity, right? Between safety precautions and reduction in tourism and reduction in, in the public feeling comfortable in going out and about, it's hard to meet those guidelines. And also, if you recall, the PPP had a really short uh, time frame for which you could use it. Now that was extended a little bit, but really we're, we're looking at a long-term problem. And we also don't really want to focus on loans. The restaurant revitalization fund would allow people to not only pay for those employees and pay for rent, but pay for supplies. And that's also a key difference. When you talk about that 65% of, of income from restaurants going right back out into the community, the PPP doesn't help with that nearly as much as the restaurant revitalization fund does, in allowing us to go back and pay for, pay for supplies. And, and Erica, is do, do you all envision the um... The, the funds through the Restaurant Act, would those be administered by the U.S. Treasury? Um, would, would that be more so administered by state local governments that would actually mobilize that, those dollars to restaurants in their immediate community? Or, or ha has that even been, ha has the apparatus been considered at all? It, it has been considered. Um, the fund would be run through the U.S. Treasury and it 
would prioritize small businesses owned by women and uh, members of the black indigenous and communities of color. So, and also small, small businesses. So the first 14 days of the restaurant revitalization fund would allow access by those communities that I just mentioned and people that have a gross revenue of 1.5 million or less. So one of the things we saw with the PPP is that we had huge swaths of communities unable to access those funds beyond the fact that restaurants and hospitality uh, businesses did not access more than I believe 8% of those funds. If you dig a little bit deeper and you look at folks that don't have maybe long-standing relationships with the banks, they really struggled to get those loans. So this flips the PPP model on its ear a bit and puts those communities right up front um, and it would be administered by the treasury. Okay, now that, 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 that would, um, that certainly I, I, I love the component around, you know, prioritizing uh, minority owned restaurants or businesses. I, I, I think there, there was a misnomer out there that I saw on Facebook at one point that said the Restaurant Act was only for minority owned restaurants. So thank you for clarifying that, that really what you're trying to do is provide a, a point of preference um, in terms of supporting those marginalized businesses before you allow others to, to, to apply. And, and then m one of my last questions about the Restaurant Act, and I've got a question for you about advocacy, then I'm gonna turn it over to, to the audience here for whatever questions you all may have for Erica. Um, if, if the Restaurant Act doesn't pass, I know it's passed the House, it's got installed on the Senate side. Uh, the White House has been fairly non-committal whether or not they wanted to provide industry-specific aid to restaurants and bars. If, if this doesn't pass, if this doesn't happen, what do you predict will happen to independently owned restaurants and bars? Okay, well, you have to know I'm belligerently optimistic, so I try not to think about what that looks like and just focus on us making so much noise and getting so much attention by our members of the Senate that we will get them to focus on us and to, to pass this bill. If that doesn't happen, um, right now, before the election, then we hunker down and we keep talking about it. If it if it never happens, uh, that is a catastrophic event. Uh, one of my colleagues, Andrew Zimmern, likes to say it is an extinction event for independent restaurants. And I do believe that is the case. No, I, I, I hate to agree with you, but I think you're right. I, I think as we get further and further and deeper into the, the colder months and more, more of this PPP money runs out for so many restaurant and bar owners, they're going to have to make some really tough decisions. And, and you know, we haven't been through a, a winter quite yet where, where we've had to deal with COVID-19. You know, all this sort of came into place as we were moving into spring. I think me, along with a lot of other people, were optimistic that the warmer weather might help curtail the virus. But that, that hasn't quite happened the way we, we anticipated. And so I think as we get into normal, regular flu season, it's going to be a really interesting battle because you, you won't know who has what. And I, I think that's going to psychologically impact a lot of customers. Customers are already very fearful right now about coming out to restaurants and bars. And I, I think that situation be begins to exacerbate itself as we get into the colder months. So I, I totally, totally agree with you. And you, you say make a lot of noise. And, you know, Erica, I'm a big proponent of advocating on behalf of whatever your issue might be. I've, I've been doing that for about 20 plus years. Um, you know, here in the restaurant community, you got a lot of small and pop restaurant owners who um, a lot of times don't have the time. They're, they're busy trying to run their business, their restaurant, spend time with their family, uh, participate in their communities. And to those people that really feel like they don't understand how to advocate, um, what would you say to them? I mean, what, what's the best way to get started? Is, is it a phone call? Is it an email? Do you go rally outside your congressman's office? I mean, what do you, what do you all recommend? Well, um, you, you hit on something very important there. It all depends on how much time you can devote to the cause. I mean, I should just say that the 185 members of the Independent Restaurant Coalition that are on the leadership calls are all volunteers who have all carved out so much time to do this work. We have 
calls twice a week for about an hour and we've been doing that since March 18th. We actually started with calls almost five days a week. So um, there is a point when your livelihood is at stake that you make the time. Um, I do appreciate that it's it's very hard and time is crunched. And I know you in particular are juggling many, many things and squeezing things in between the edges. One of the fastest ways and easiest ways for you to participate is to go to saverestaurants.com. And right from our homepage, there is a take action page. There's a little screen that will pop up and it will help you with one of those nifty little auto mailers. So you just type in your zip code and information and we will get a message to your representatives. And in this case, we're really focusing on the Senate at this point because the Restaurants Act was included in the HEROES Act. We are focusing all of our effort on the Senate. Um, your senators, um, I do know that Senator Burr has not signed on in support of the Restaurants Act. So um, a quick call or email, being very polite, and even if you're not a restaurant owner, simply saying that you support restaurants, you want an opportunity to dine out at your favorite neighborhood spot, you feel that your neighborhood is better off with these businesses. Maybe you're a, a farmer, maybe you're that florist, you know, those are your customers and your livelihood depends on them. So letting people know how restaurants impact your life and that you want them to be supported by the Senate goes a real long way. And I'll tell you, I have always been somewhat involved in advocacy, but just four years ago got super involved and I put my representatives phone numbers in my phone and save them. And so if I was standing in line someplace, which we all now do a lot since we have, I don't know if your grocery stores are like mine, but there's usually a long line waiting to get in or the farmer's market. And in that time, I can call each one of my representatives and leave a message. And I make sure that I don't just call and ask for things when they do things that I appreciate, like my congressman is Congressman Blumenauer. I am the first to call and say thank you for his work and that even those simple messages go a long way. So the very first thing and easiest thing to do is go to our website, saverestaurants.com, use the email or tool. If you're up for making some more phone calls or getting in a little bit more deeply into the advocacy work, on that very same web page under the resources tab, you can find the fact sheet that I see you shared in the chat. We also have a little lobby kit. It's a one page guide that says how to reach out to your senators, tells you how to find them, gives you a little script, they, sort of like playing Mad Libs, you can fill in the blanks, so it makes it real easy. And thank you so much. And um, it's over there in the chat. And it also helps to know what issues are near and dear to your representative's heart, whether we're talking about the Restaurants Act and talking to your senators or whether it's talking to your local policymakers, know, knowing where they like to shop, knowing if they've been advocating on for workforce, whether they've been advocating, you know, whatever their pet issues are, whatever their focus areas are, knowing those issues helps when you make that call. Uh, for those of you that worked have worked in restaurants, we, we say you just matri diem a bit. Get to know them before they walk in the front door. So you've got, you know, their favorite beverage on the table when you have the conversation. No, Eric, I think that's all great advice. I, I love your, your piece about also reaching out when they do something right and, and not just when they do something wrong. Because I, I, I think at the core of being able to effectively advocate you have to have a relationship, you know, with these congressional members and their staffers. And the, the way you build a relationship is not by reaching out only when you want something, but, but also reaching out when you just may need to give some kudos and pats on the back. So, I, you know, Eric, I think you, um, I, I love the advice. I did provide the lobby guide that she just talked about. It's in the chat as, as long as the facts on North Carolina. Um, and I know so many of you uh, may feel like, because I know when I first started doing advocacy work, I would feel like, well, why, why should I send a letter? Why should I send an email? There, you know, no one's ever going to read it anyway. You know, that's, that's a waste of time. And I happened to be serving on a governmental affairs committee for the Winston-Salem Chamber one year. 
and we were meeting with, um, then he was Congressman Richard Burr, Representative Richard Burr, not Senator. And we, we talked about some issues that he was getting ready to vote on. And he explained that he was so happy that he heard from us because the, these, these representatives are looking at all types of issues from A to Z. And a lot of times they don't know a lot about them. And if they don't hear from the district, if they don't hear from you, they don't really understand what your position is. So you, you may feel like that letter or that phone call or that email doesn't really scratch the surface, but believe it or not, it does. It, it does help them to know um, what's going on in their district and, and how you feel about a, a specific issue. Just a couple of points about the Restaurant Act before I, before I turn it over for questions and comments. Um, the Restaurant Act would galvanize North Carolina's tourism industry encouraging travelers to eat in North Carolina's establishments and spend money. You're involved. breaking up. I'm sorry. Okay. I may have an unstable connection. Just bear with me. Uh, money on lodging, other tourist attractions, and retail generating 2.6. We're hearing something like one or two words every 10 seconds from you. Okay. Um, generating $2.6 billion, which would be the eighth largest increase in the nation. Um, the Restaurant Act would also provide $481 million in benefits. And we seem to, to have lost them to uh, bakers, fishermen, butchers. I and do like it when the pod father speaks. That's <laughs> rather... Oh, he's back. Yes. I'm taking over your, I'm taking over your podcast or your, uh, your broadcast. No, here. no. Yeah. I'm glad you did. I, again, I'm very sorry about that. Um, technology at, at, at its best here, but yes, I have I to step in and you know, if I have to step in, things are going awry. <laughs> I, I just, I was just trying to provide a few, a few touch points on the restaurant at, Hey, real, real quick, Greg Thompson, you still there, my friend? Can you can you just chime in on the advocacy piece a little bit too before we we let everyone jump in here? Because I I know that's what you guys do almost daily there. Uh, well, we we uh, get our the issues from from our members, and we are uh, I'm the registered lobbyist for NFIB, and I'm working with uh, the legislators and the different business issues. It's kind of ironic. I was kept turning my head because the governor's office and the, the uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen was just giving a briefing on COVID today and Lynn Menges, president of the North Carolina restaurant. It, she was on um, giving, giving information. It was just on uh, just five minutes ago during this, during this call. Uh, I, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but uh I mean, the, the numbers are going in the wrong way. But as far as advocacy, we we uh, work closely with uh, a coalition of business associations, and and these issues we uh, we we take we split up the the the, the legislate excuse me the legislators and um, and and go visit them when they're in town. Go visit them if they're not. Make calls. Uh, when the legislation comes up, whether it's, you know, regulations that we don't, that, that are uh, 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 detrimental to, to, to independent business owners, uh, we work together to try to, to uh, defeat those. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's crucial that, you know, we're all in this one together, of course, and whether we're independent or public or whatever, we, we've got to, to, to make sure that the decision makers uh, and I think right now the, the governor's office, I mean, you, you know, Algernon, you were talking about winter coming on and, and a lot of the restaurants are only hanging on because they have out, outdoor seating. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, what's going to happen uh, when it gets cold and, and they can't seat outside. And, 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 you know, there's a, you know, we, we've got to get the governor's office and, and, and get to them and, and try to work with, uh, uh, you know, getting, you know, more uh, uh, seating percentage or whatever inside as we, as we come into the colder weather, uh, because it's just going to mean, you know, more and more uh, restaurants are not going to be able to open their doors. Um, so, but as far as the advocacy, we're, we're, we work both on the federal and the state level uh, with, with anything that comes up pertaining to the, to the independent business, uh, business uh, angles. Let me give you my um, quick little wrap up of the Restaurants Act and with a couple of key points, one of which I think is, is critical to your state. 
No other industry is suffering more unemployment than restaurants. Nearly one in four jobs lost during the pandemic was from restaurant and bar workers. That means that we are down 2.5 million jobs since the pandemic began. And employment and leisure and hospitality fell in nine states in August. You know, it's been ticking up in some places. It fell in nine states, one of those being North Carolina. So the Restaurants Act, as you know, passed in the House as part of the HEROES Act, but it has bipartisan support. There are more than 40 senators on board, Republican and Democrat. So we just need to to keep pushing those senators and get a little bit further so that the moment they go back to work, we are top of mind and we get your hospitality business back on track there in North Carolina. All right, with that said, I'm gonna open the floor to anyone who has any questions. Anyone wanna kick us off at all or? So Algernon, real quick, let me introduce myself. I'm Michael Sharp and I own the Scorpio Lounge in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we happen to be one of the oldest private bars in the state of North Carolina. Um, I've been shut down since March 17th. Not a single penny of revenue coming into my business for now seven and a half months. Governor just reopened in phase three allowed me to have outdoor seating uh, based on the size of my patio. I can have 29 people sitting outside all of you guys know and particularly for greg 29 people in my club which holds 850 people doesn't do me any good no one comes to a club to sit outside so we've got to you know and for those that don't know in north carolina our abc abc system private bars out of the 7,000 or so ABC permits that are issued in the state of North Carolina, there's 1,063 private bars that have not been allowed to open their doors until a week ago. Uh, and then we were allowed to open our doors at either seven people per thousand square feet of outdoor space or 30% of our stated outdoor occupancy. So, and and then had to stop serving at 11. And have to stop serving at 11 p.m. Let's, let's face it, I don't usually open till 10 p.m. So, you know, I'm a late night bar and that, that does nothing to me. You know, me and my partners have said, we literally lose more money by opening than we do staying closed. And this restaurant act is fantastic. I, I've got to say, I've had my feelings hurt a little on here. Everybody's talking about restaurants. Hey, I'm just a little old bar out right here, okay? Let's not forget about us. So anyway, I just, you know, it, it, it's been frustrating seven months. Uh, I, I feel like that, you know, private bars in North Carolina have been the low hanging fruit that we've been allowed to be. Oh, let's, we can show that we're doing something by keeping bars closed. And there's been a lot of negative publicity about bars in particular. Some of it's been self-inflicted. I will admit that, you know, our industry doesn't always act responsibly. However, we can, you know, and we have a North Carolina Bar and Tavern Association that we, you know, we have a very comprehensive safety guide for all of our members and every bar in the state of North Carolina that shows how we can open and can open safely. However, it's fallen on deaf ears with our governor and basically our general assembly. So. Well, and, and Erica, you know, I know a lot of what we talked about today was pertaining to restaurants. I know a lot of people on your leadership committee are restaurant centric, but from my understanding, the act is designed to help bars as well, right? It is. It is restaurants and bars. It is restaurants and bars and even tasting rooms. So uh, winery, brewery, distillery, tasting rooms. So I should be more careful to say restaurants and <laughs> bars. It's hard when your name is the Independent Restaurant Coalition, but you're in there. And, <laughs> and, and heard loud and clear here in Oregon, the closing time is 10 p.m. So uh, many folks you know, took the PPP knowing that it was just going to end up being alone because they weren't going to reopen, but it allowed them to hang on to their property. Um, 
Yeah, I, I hear you loud and clear, and you are included very much in the Restaurants Act. You know, and, and that's, that's the issue is many of us small bar and restaurant owners, you know, at this point alone does us absolutely no good. We are, as Greg said, we're going into a winter season, already our slowest, particularly for my industry and my club, already the slowest part of the year, you know, from spring till fall, I make about 65, 60, 65 percent of my revenue. Now I'm heading into my slowest season with limited capacity, limited um, a sales curfew, you know, basically everything working against us. You know, in seven months without having any revenue at all, you know, we've gone through vast majority of our resources at this point. Hey, and Michael, can I put you on the spot on something real, real, real quick? Because I think everyone else would, would, would get value from hearing this. You, you posted a letter that you received from the state of North Carolina in our Eat, Drink, Triad group. Can you, can you talk about that letter you received in regards to unemployment for your, for your employees? Sure. So all of my employees that were drawing unemployment, um, at this point, they had processed through each one of them. And now we were at the extended benefit portion of unemployment. Uh, and over the last two weeks, we've all gotten letters that basically have said, because the unemployment level fell below the Department of Labor uh, threshold to be high, high unemployment, that that benefit is being reduced from the 10 weeks that it was. Now it's being reduced down to six weeks. And in, in some instance, in my employees, they had already exceeded that six weeks, so their unemployment stopped as of last week. You know, and I'm not opening for another two weeks, you know, if I open then. So, you know, it's just, it, it seems like at this point, from the federal level down to the state level, that at every turn, we're, when we started this pandemic, everybody goes, oh, this will be a few months. And they made all of these plans and they put all of these processes into place. And everything ends, you know, the, either in July, you know, the, there was something they needed in July or, you know, everything has an end date. Well, we've gone way past, you know, the PPP, everything, and same thing, but for some reason, unemployment has not been one of those items that got extended. And, you know, as Erica said earlier, I think one in four jobs have been lost so you know and it's not just as simple as you know Al and I can attest to particularly on Facebook the re quick response is well just go get another job we see job listings out there all the time well it's not quite that simple and I, I don't know how to change that public perception that it's not just about going out and finding another job uh, yeah. So, you know, and the same thing with uh, Greg was speaking about uh, people fearful going out. You know, our governor and our health department, Mandy Cohen, has done an excellent job over the last seven months of scaring the hell out of everybody that it's not safe to go out to restaurants and bars. And it's going to take us a long time to get over literally that fear tactic that's been instilled in the population. I was talking to other bar owners this week and you know we we figure that it will take us at least a year and a half to two years to get back to where we were prior covid you know and it doesn't seem like anyone is taking that into consideration this is not just a light switch approach where you flip it on and everything goes back to normal it's not going to happen and you know we are going to struggle and there's going to be a lot of us that don't make it no, I, I, I think you're right. I, I do. I see us running out of time. So I do want to make sure we work in one or two more questions that they're out there. Paula, I saw you go off mute. Did you did you have a question for Erica? Or? Well, I really don't have a question. I, I kind of have a, a story that leads to a statement. Um, I am not a restaurateur, although I grew up being raised by a restaurateur. My father was 15 when he had his first job in a bakery in 1945, then decided he would drop out of high school. Not wise but then went into the Air Force. 
and through hard work became the personal chef to Secretary of the Air Force. And oddly enough, a week after he retired from that job, he became a United States Capitol Police officer. And I, I tell that story to tell this. One thing he sincerely believed was in advocacy. He worked with every congressman and senator throughout his 20-year 20, 20 career. And I think people have been very, I think we have been trained that they are, they are not approachable. But if he were here today, he would say that is their job. Their job is to listen to us and to respond to us. But if we don't speak to them, if we don't pick up the baton and amass enough voices, um, then we cannot be heard. And again, I'm not a restaurateur. I did start a blog five or six months ago to champion restaurateurs because I, this industry is near and dear to me. In addition, you know, all, most, most chefs also have a private catering business, so I grew up in that. But I, I was so fortunate to see both sides. And so although it's frustrating, and although I know many of you do not feel heard and you're not getting the answers you want, you can't stop short in the advocacy line. There, there is a, a need to gather strength and maybe be the lone nut. And so Algernon, thank you so much. I, I really don't have a, the background you all have, but I do have an advocacy background and I, I'm just telling you, you can't stop short. I well, love I, that story. <laughs> well, and I was just gonna say, I think the fact that, that Paula, you're here is, is so important. And, and I hope those on the, the call that are restaurateurs and bar owners take notice of this. It, you know, Paula is, is one of our customers and she cares a lot about what we do. She's supportive of what we do. She, she's taken her time to start a, a blog highlighting the, the, the food and beverage community here in our region. If, you know, go follow Food Venturist if you haven't done that. You know, she's got a group page on Facebook. She's got some presence on Instagram. But, you know, as you go to advocate for our industry, just keep in mind that part of it is, yes, we need to advocate as owner operators, but we also need to mobilize our employees to, to, to advocate on, on behalf of the reasons that Michael just shared, because they, they have a vested interest in the outcome as well. But even more so, we need our customers to be advocating and helping people like Senator Burr and Senator Tillis to, to recognize why the Restaurant Act is so critically important. So, you know, if you can, you know, one of the things that um, Claire Calvin, who is not here with us today, who's on our leadership committee, one thing Claire and I've talked about is trying to activate more customers to make videos and post them online, um, essentially calling out Senator Tillis and Senator Burr to not let our neighborhood restaurants um, get decimated. And so that, that's a great way to activate your customers and get, get, get them out speaking about what it is we do. Um, I don't see anyone else off mute, so I'm going to try to wrap us up here unless someone just has a burning question. Or um, Erica, did you have anything you want to add before I wrap us up? Or? I'll give you two little things. One is that if advocacy sounds intimidating, think of it as storytelling because your political leaders are so darn busy, they don't have a chance to hear everybody's story. And just in sharing your story and sharing your challenges, even if you don't have an immediate ask, even if it's not going in and saying, I mean, obviously right now I'd like you to go talk about the Restaurants Act, but any given day, if you can call and say, I want you to know about my business. I want you to know as an employee, like, yeah, sure, I'd love to go find another job, but there aren't any. Like giving that per them that perspective of what's happening on the ground is really, really, really important. And if you're going to do those videos, you can do one to Senator Burr saying, please support restaurants, and one to Senator Tillis saying, thank you for supporting restaurants. So you can, again, do that, um, that demanding and the gratitude. Gratitude goes real far. I, like I just that. want to also say thank you so much for having me. And if any of you all end up with questions after this conversation, uh, you're welcome to connect with me through um, the Restaurant Coalition. And uh, Algernon has my email. I'm not going to share it since this is on Facebook Live, but I would, would love to hear from you um, and happy to be of service in any way that I can. Greg, I saw you pop off mute. Did you have something you want to add or? I just wanted to add to what Eric was saying. I, I served in the house for 10 years. And as far as advocacy, the, the, the first thing is to make sure that, that you go to your, your representative first and foremost, because they are going to, I, I'm going to listen to somebody that can vote for me 
first and foremost before I'm going to listen to somebody that's out of district. Everybody needs to be contacted. All the, all the elected officials need to be contacted. But but you need to make sure that you you talk to in these videos. Uh, send them send them to your to your to your your representative and your senator because it is crucial that 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 the ones that you can vote for are are are, are uh, contacted first because they're going to they're going to respond. Well, once again, guys, the um, the two voices that you I didn't mean for Greg to be a part of the program, but he's become a, a a big part of the program this afternoon too. But the two voices you've been listening to, Erica Pomar is a founding member and the chief operating officer for the Independent Restaurant Coalition, and they are running the Save Restaurant campaign, which is connected to the 120 billion dollar Restaurant Act. and And I would strongly encourage you to to go find out more about go visit their website. I've shared some information in the chat. I'm available um, anytime you want to speak more about IRC and, and figure out how you can get involved and engaged. They do have a Facebook group called Save Restaurants. I would encourage you to go, go join that group. There's some really good information that gets shared there. Go follow them on Instagram, on Facebook, Twitter. Um, they, are, they are really, really active right now. And they've been doing a lot of earned media. I've seen um, people from the leadership committee on the Today Show and all types of um, news programs out there. So they are very active. Um, the other person you heard from was Greg Thompson. Greg Thompson's the state director for the National Federation of Independent Businesses and another great resource to dial in and plug into and keep up with what's going on with small businesses across the, across the state. Um, again, I apologize for the earlier tech issues, but we will have a video of this discussion available um, here this afternoon, you can go to Triad Food and Beverage Coalition to our Facebook page, and you'll be able to get access to that video. We also will share it within our group, which is Eat Drink Triad. Um, so if you're not a part of the group, we would certainly encourage you to, to join that group. Um, and, and then also, we are going to be rolling out more advocacy workshops within the course of October and early November, where we're going to be doing more education around how you can actually advocate on behalf of this industry. What are some things that you can do to really help us out and move us forward? Uh, we are working with um, some of our local TV stations to roll out a um, PSA campaign that will be a video series highlighting some of the destruction that's been done in the food and beverage industry and what it is that we feel like is needed in order to move us forward. So you'll see those videos starting to come out most likely late October going into November. Um, and I know WXII, um, Fox 8, um, Intercom Radio, all, all, all of those and, and, and several others have agreed to support us on that effort. So again, thank you all for investing some time with us today. Um, always good to see you. Um, certainly reach out if I can do any, if I can be of a support of any kind of way. Thank you all. Good day. Thank you.